Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Happy Holy Week. So if you're Catholic like me or any kind of mainline Protestant denomination, I'm sure that you listened to the gospel detailing of Jesus's passion and crucifixion last week. And then next week on Easter, you'll be looking forward to the resurrection, which is really the kind of the crux, the, the center of our religious belief that Christ came down to earth. He suffered and paid the price for our sins, and then he was resurrected on the third day. Central to that story of Jesus's passion is the man who condemned Jesus to death, Pontius Pilate, who was the prefect of Judea at the time that Jesus lived. Now, depending on your denomination, Pilate has a different reputation. Some people, you know, see him as a villain. They really, they hate him. Uh, other people see him as a necessary mechanism for Christ to be crucified and that he really didn't do anything wrong. He was pressured into doing it. Um, you know, growing up when I was a kid, the lesson of Pontius Pilate was always don't do what the crowd says. Don't don't always give in to the peer pressure, right? Because, you know, just, just so people will like you. That's a really shallow interpretation of Pontius Pilate. Um, a couple of years ago, while I was still a peer minister in college, I was asked to give a presentation and it could be about anything I wanted. It could be kind of related to your major, right? Because we had people who were biology majors and we had people who were political science majors like myself. So I wanted to look into the politics of the crucifixion. Why did Pilate condemn Jesus to die, right? It couldn't have been just as simple as the crowd was getting kind of uppity and they're upset and Pilate's just like, all right, fine, I'll just kill this guy. And so that's the information I want to share with you today. We're going to take a look at Pontius Pilate, the political position that he found himself in at the time of Jesus's crucifixion and why he really in my opinion, isn't culpable for the death of Jesus Christ. So in order to understand why Pilate did what he did, first we need to know who the man was. And unfortunately, outside of the gospel narrative, we really don't have a lot of information about him. He definitely existed. Uh, he is attested by multiple Jewish, Christian, non-Christian, Roman sources that there was a governor of Judea named Pontius Pilate. And he likely took power in 26 AD, he would have been appointed by the Emperor Tiberius. Tiberius was not really that interested in governing. Tiberius spent most of his time on his private island in Capri. We'll get more into that later, but he wasn't really governing. He basically left all the administration up to the head of the Praetorian Guard, a man named Sejanus. And so it's under Sejanus's suggestion that Pilate is appointed to be governor of Judea. Now at this time, Judea is at the, the far outskirts of the empire. And it's full of these strange people who only worship one god, the Jews. And the Jews at this time are kind of a rowdy bunch. They don't really like being governed by a pagan empire. Obviously, they want to be free, so there's constantly stirrings and small rebellions. And so it's kind of a contentious area that Pilate is being thrown into as governor. So almost immediately on Pilate's arrival, he already starts stirring up controversy with the Jews. He marches his troops in with their standard, which had a picture of the emperor on it. And this enraged the Jews. The Jews at this time are total iconoclasts. They believe that this is a graven image, and it's highly offensive to them. And so they stage a protest in the provincial capital of Caesarea. They have like a sit-in. So the Jews occupy Caesarea for about five days until Pilate finally responds by sending in troops. And so he surrounds the Jews and has his troops pull their sword and orders them to disperse, right, under threat of violence. And the Jews hold their ground. They're not going to leave. And so Pilate orders his troops to withdraw, and he relents and he takes down the standards, no longer displays them. So this is kind of telling, I think, about who Pilate is as a person. Many Roman governors, many Romans would have just massacred the people who dared to stand against the empire, especially for something like protesting the image of the emperor being displayed in a Roman castle. So I think this is instructive as to who Pilate is. He doesn't want to inaugurate his governorship with bloodshed. And so he withdraws, he relents, he takes down the standards, and he gives, it, he gives in to the Jewish demand. About a year later, there's two more controversies that get Pilate into trouble with the Jewish population. Um, first, he took money from the temple, which was supposed to be sacred. The Jews were not supposed to be taxed from that money. That was set up with Julius Caesar when they were an ally of Rome. He allowed the Jews to collect taxes for the temple, and that money was not supposed to be touched by Rome. Well, Pilate took some of the pot and he used it to build an aqueduct. So you could say he did it for a good purpose. He, he brought in water to Jerusalem, 
but the Jews weren't having any of it, right? That's sacred money. It's not supposed to go to pagan hands for non-religious purposes. This time when the Jews protest, Pilate has his soldiers infiltrate the crowd with cloaks on covering their armor, and he orders the people to disperse. And when the Jews refuse, he has his soldiers club the Jews and push them out that way. Now, there were some deaths in this incident, and it was a violent way of breaking up the protest. But again, I think it's instructive of Pilate's unwillingness to use the full force of the Roman military to solve his problems, right? He didn't massacre the people like he probably could have done. He just engages in police brutality until they leave. So again, not necessarily moral or kind, but in the context of the time, this is a rather metered response. Similar to the affair of the standards, in an incident that's now known as the episode of the Golden Shields, Pilate put these golden shields around the courtyard of his palace. Now, Pilate learned his lesson from the affair of the standards. He didn't depict an image of the emperor on the shields, but he did have his name and the title Divi Filius, which is Latin for son of God. Now, this was a title used by emperors. It goes back to Augustus, who was the first emperor, trying to make himself legitimate in the eyes of the people when he took over. After his adopted father, Julius Caesar, was assassinated, he had him deified. And so then he could say, I'm the son of God. And then they did the same thing to Augustus when he died. And so then Tiberius could say, I'm the son of God. I have a, a right to the throne of Rome. So this will come up later with Pilate's interaction with Jesus. But just understand that the Romans believed in incarnation of gods. And they believed in many gods. And they believed that the gods could have children with other people. The Romans were kind of superstitious. This time Pilate refused to take the shields down. He had had enough of the Jews imposing their religious views on him as the prefect. And so the Jews staged a formal protest to the emperor. They wrote him a letter complaining that the prefect that they had sent is not respecting their religion and is making them upset. And Tiberius, who again is not one for politics, probably a little bit grumpy that he has to step away from his life of luxury for a few minutes to send a letter to Pilate, tells him to knock it off, just take the shields down, you know, stop making the Jews upset. And so Pilate does this. So we got to give Pilate some credit here. Um, he is governing in an extraordinarily volatile part of the world. In the far off reaches of the empire, not a lot of support, right? It's kind of a backwater of civilization at that time. And so he really is doing his best to try to govern with as little bloodshed and with as light of a hand as he possibly can. He is relatively gracious and receptive to the demands of the Jewish people. Again, this is a very strange people to the Romans. The Romans believed in many gods. And so for the Jews to have one god and then to demand that the Romans, who are their occupiers, respect that and respect their religious customs is kind of presumptuous for a conquered people, but Pilate does acquiesce on many occasions. The Jews did not want to be occupied. Nobody wants to be occupied, but many peoples were able to be integrated into the Roman Empire with not a whole lot of issue. The Jews were vehemently against this. It was against their religion to be subordinated to the pagans. They refused to participate in Roman cults. They made it very difficult for the Romans to be gracious, and they were being relatively gracious to the Jews. Again, they had many protections going as far back as Julius Caesar. They were not forced to participate in Roman cults. They didn't need to adopt the Roman pantheon. They were allowed to collect taxes on their own for the temple. They were allowed to practice their strange practices of sacrificing thousands of lambs and just having the blood run through the street once a year. So the Romans were pretty tolerant to the Jews, despite the Jews being totally intolerant to the Romans. And so this is the people that Pilate has to govern, these people that do not want anything to do with Rome. They would like to be freed at the first possible convenience. And this was what they were believing the Messiah was going to do. They believed that the Messiah would be a religious leader and a military leader who would lead them to victory against the Romans. And so even after the time of Jesus and Pilate, you have multiple messiahs coming forward to liberate the Jews from their Roman occupiers. First in 66 AD, you have the first Jewish revolt, and that's crushed by the Romans and the temple is destroyed in 70 AD. So that kind of upends the whole Jewish religion at the time. No temple, no sacrifice, no priesthood, no Judaism. And then in 132 AD, there is another revolt called the Bar Kokhba revolt, 
in which the Jews actually take over Jerusalem. They massacre all the Christians and the Romans inside the city. Emperor Hadrian then has to send several legions to go and liberate Jerusalem. And at this point, I think the Romans had had enough of the Jews revolting. And so they massacred all the Jews they could get their hands on. They destroyed the city and they expelled all the other Jews out of Judea. And that's you know where we get the Jewish diaspora of today. So now that we have a backdrop as to kind of the religious situation and the situation on the ground, I want to talk more about Pilate's political position. So as I mentioned earlier, Pilate was appointed by Emperor Tiberius at the behest of a man named Sejanus. This was the head of the Praetorian Guard, and he was basically in charge of running the empire. Tiberius wasn't really that interested in politics after his oldest son Germanicus died under mysterious circumstances, and so in grief, he went to his island resort in Capri, which, if you believe Suetonius, was a veritable Epstein's island where Tiberius was engaging in we'll say extracurricular activities with young boys. But so while Tiberius was gallivanting around like Dan Schneider, Sejanus was maneuvering himself to become emperor himself. Likely. We're not 100% certain, but it appears that he was moving in that direction. So Sejanus has half the Senate purged, either killed or forces them to kill themselves, takes all their property, and then appoints people who are sympathetic to him in their place. He also has the widow of Germanicus. Remember, this is Tiberius's oldest son. He has his widow exiled along with her two older children, both of whom die in exile. Now, the youngest son, Caligula, is sent to go live with Grandpa Tiberius on Capri, which, again, if the rumors are true that Tiberius was Jared Fogling a bunch of little boys, we can kind of see why maybe Caligula was a little bit angsty in his adult years. Sejanus then got a little bit too flagrant with Tiberius, and he tried to marry into his family. He wanted to marry the widow of Drusus, who was one of the sons that died in exile, and Tiberius would not have that. I think this broke the trust between the two of them, and eventually Tiberius figured out what Sejanus was trying to do. And so he had him strangled on the Senate floor, and then his body cast down the Senate steps and left there for the public to see. Now at this point, Tiberius wakes up, and he's able to pull himself away from sniffing little kids long enough to order that the half of the Senate that Sejanus had appointed be killed and purged and driven out of the country. Then he goes on a purging spree of anybody that Sejanus had a hand in installing. And so that would include Pontius Pilate. Now Pilate was far away, and he certainly didn't have anything to do with Sejanus's plot to try to take the throne for himself. So I think that Tiberius kind of left him alone, or maybe he just forgot about him. But that's exactly what Pilate would have needed. He recognized how delicate the position that he was in. He was appointed by the guy who just got strangled and thrown down the steps for treason. And he had already had run-ins with Tiberius, having to tell him to knock it off, stop making the Jews upset. So he really knew that if he screwed up anymore, it would likely be his head. So what Pilate needs in his life is for things to just settle down, needs a little bit of stability, hoping that Tiberius forgets about him or dies, and everything will be okay. And then, of course, the most controversial man who has ever existed is brought before him in his palace, and now he is central to the most important and the most controversial incident that has ever happened. And Pilate is probably there just, like, by Mars. Why? <laughs> So it's impossible to say with 100% certainty what Pilate made of Jesus when he first encountered him. He was probably made aware of Jesus at some time during his ministry. Uh, Jesus was walking around Judea for three years, healing and driving out demons, causing a stir everywhere he went. Uh, eventually, he comes into Jerusalem. There's the incident of him flipping the tables. There's a procession of palms and Jesus enters the city. So Pilate probably had some kind of previous knowledge of who Jesus was, at least that this person existed and was kind of a celebrity. And because of that, Pilate probably didn't want to touch this case with a 29 and a half foot pole because he knew Jesus was popular and he didn't want to kill him because that could cause instability, right? There could be a riot among the people who like him. So he interrogates Jesus for a little while, doesn't really see any fault in him. Eventually it comes up in Jesus's interrogation that he is from Galilee, which means that he's not actually under Pilate's jurisdiction. Galilee is not in Judea at this time. He's actually under the jurisdiction of Herod, who was a client king of Rome at the time. And so Pilate's like, perfect, I'll just pawn him off on Herod, Herod will deal with him, and then it's out of my hands, people won't be upset at me, and we can just 
get through Passover, we can get all the Jews out of Jerusalem, and we survive another year. So when Jesus gets to Herod, Herod wants Jesus to perform him some miracles, right? To show that he's a wizard or magician or whatever. And Jesus refuses. He's, he's not going to do that. That's not what he's here for. So Herod, incensed, sends Jesus back to Pilate, dresses him up like a fake king. And in the gospel, it says that Herod and Pilate became friends because of this incident. Perhaps that was why Herod dressed Jesus up as a king. You know, he's given Pilate a gift of the cloak or whatever. And they develop a mutual respect trying this case together. Now, Pilate may not understand Jewish religion very well, but he certainly understands the Jewish people. He understands the people that he is working with, right? Because Rome didn't totally dominate the people that they occupied. They allowed for local leaders to have a say. They really relied on them to keep people in line to a large extent. And so Pilate probably had a lot of experience dealing with the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the chief priests. So he knows their game. He knows that they're jealous of Jesus. He knows that they're worried that he's undermining their power. And so he doesn't want to play their game. So he says, I'm going to punish Jesus, and then I'm going to let him go. And it's not a, that's not enough for the priests, but Pilate appeals to the crowd, thinking, if I can get the crowd on my side, court of public opinion, I can kind of force the chief priests to relent, and we can just be done with this whole thing. Because the people like Jesus. Jesus is popular among the common people. At least he was when he first came into Jerusalem. It's around this time that Pilate's wife tells him to have nothing to do with Jesus, that she had a bad dream about it, and that it's going to lead to Pilate's downfall. So now Pilate's between his wife and the chief priests and the crowd and so his situation just continues to deteriorate and it becomes more and more difficult for him to stay objective and to meter out justice properly so now we all know this part of the story Pilate goes to the crowd and he says it's passover i released you one prisoner every year so do you want me to release jesus or do you want me to release barabbas and he's hoping that the people will just say jesus because they like jesus the chief priests and the pharisees they rile up the crowd and they get them to chant for Barabbas to be released instead of Jesus. Well, so shoot, the pilot's plan didn't work. The people are now calling for Jesus' head and he's not in any better position than he was. So he has Jesus flogged. That's the scourging at the pillar. And he's hoping that by then presenting a battered and beaten Jesus to the crowd, they'll feel sorry for him, especially since Pilate's saying that he's innocent. And then they will call for him to be released. And then again, he can just be done with this. He doesn't need to worry about upsetting one crowd over the other crowd. Everybody will just be happy that Jesus is released and Pilate can go about his business. Again, this doesn't work. The priests then accuse Jesus of blasphemy for saying that he is the son of God. Now this term again means something to Pilate. He understands that son of God is a title for the emperor. He believes that this is a incarnation of a God and a man that can exist. And so Pilate's like, oh, great. Is this guy a demigod? Is he some kind of god? You know, now you've got heaven looking down on what you're doing. You've got your wife on one side. You've got the priests. You've got Tiberius. You have all these people that you're trying to satisfy to keep your own skin intact. Probably in desperation, Pilate appeals to Jesus. He's like, I have the power over life and death. Like, I control your destiny. You've got to give me something here, right? Are you a god? Are you not a god? Like, what, what is going on here? And Jesus is totally unhelpful and just says, you only have power because God gives you power. And Pilate's probably just like, I'm trying to help. So all Pilate gets is a, is a man with a death wish and a crowd that's you know on the verge of rioting. So in one final attempt to not kill Jesus and to satisfy the crowd, he presents Jesus and he says, behold your king, hoping that the people will say, oh, he's not our king, and then therefore undermined their charge that he was trying to usurp Rome or trying to make himself a king, and then he can release Jesus and just get this over with. But the people don't bite. They say something that's really uncharacteristic for them. They say, we have no king but Caesar. So Pilate is basically screwed at this point. On one hand, if he kills Jesus, he's got heaven looking down on him, right? Whatever deity Jesus is the son of, Pilate is now in hot water with them, and he's still afraid that the part of the crowd that does like Jesus is going to revolt. On the other hand, if he doesn't kill Jesus, he knows that these Jews are going to write to Tiberius and complain. So then Tiberius would be like, why didn't you kill the guy who was trying to undermine my authority, who was claiming to be equal with me, saying he was the son of God? And he might just remember that Pilate exists and then come kill him for being appointed by Sejanus. And so there's no 
good way out of this for Pilot. So he does the only thing that he can really do to hopefully save his skin, that of his family, and maintain at least some stability in Judea. He washes his hands of it. He says, all right, I'm going to hand you over, but I wash my hands of this. This is not my fault. You are making me do this. And the Jewish people reply, his blood is on our head and on the heads of our children. So Jesus is handed over. He carries the cross. He's crucified. He dies. And then a man named Joseph comes before Pilate and asks if they can take the body of Jesus down and bury him. Now, normally this wouldn't be allowed. People who were crucified were crucified for high crimes like treason or murder and so their bodies were left on the crosses to rot as an example of what happens if you cross Rome. But Pilate, to his credit, he appears to be a just man and probably feeling guilty that he just condemned an innocent man to death, allows them to take Jesus's body down and to bury him. The last we hear about Pilate in the historical record is that he put down a Samaritan rebellion Pilate's then recalled by Tiberius to Rome. He likely would have been executed for incompetence and for being associated with Sejanus. But luckily, Tiberius dies before Pilate is able to make it back to Rome. And then we lose track of him. We don't know what happened. He probably just retired and just hung out in Italy. There's no definitive answer as to what happened to Pilate after he was called back to Rome. Um, there are several different traditions within different Catholic and Orthodox churches that detail what happened to Pilate. I'd say the stance of the Roman Catholic Church on Pilate is ambivalence at the worst. They see him as probably being unjust in his crucifixion of Jesus. Uh, he's pressured by the Jews and by the crowd to do so, but there's not really a whole lot there. One thing that I do know is that at least in the past, the Western churches saw the dream that Pilate's wife had as being an attack by Satan to try to get him to not crucify Jesus, because to do so would upend the salvation plan that God had for humanity. I can't find anything that that is still the case, but there are some Anglo-Saxon writings from like the 1000s that say that that is a common interpretation as to what that incident was about. The East looks far more favorably on Pontius Pilate, the Eastern Orthodox, the Copts, the Ethiopians. Within those traditions, Pontius's wife, Procla, is considered a saint in all of them. Pilate is a saint in a couple of different denominations. Some traditions hold that he converted to Christianity and was then martyred for his faith, either by being beheaded or by being crucified. Others say that he's recalled by Tiberius for killing Jesus and is put to death for that. But God appears to him and assures him that his place in heaven is secured because he was only fulfilling his role in salvation history and that he didn't do anything wrong in condemning Jesus to die. Still others say Pilate wrote to Tiberius, detailing what had happened with Jesus in his resurrection. Tiberius, being old and ill at this point, orders Pilate to track down Jesus and bring him to him. Pilate is unable to do that, whether it's because Jesus has already ascended into heaven or if he just couldn't catch up to him. But apparently he is able to track down Veronica's veil with the image of Christ on it and takes that to Tiberius and then Tiberius is healed and then Pilate becomes Christian and Tiberius becomes Christian, but in secret because at that time, if he were to convert to Christianity, then he would have been ousted or killed or what have you. I'm sure there's many other traditions. Those were just a couple that I was able to find. But again, there's nothing definitive as to what happened with Pontius Pilate. And if you're a Roman Catholic, you don't have to believe any of those traditions. So what's my point then in making this long video defending Pontius Pilate, the man who killed Jesus? Well, I don't really have a point. Um, this isn't a homily. I'm not trying to convert you or convict you or bring about some kind of spiritual change within you. I think Pilate is just a very interesting character that is often overlooked when we read through the gospel and especially the passion story. Obviously, Jesus is the central focus and then the effect of Jesus' death on his disciples. But it had a major impact on Pilate's life as well. It made Pilate the judge in probably the most well-known court case in history. And it forced him to pass judgment in an impossible situation where he has forces on all sides bearing down on him, trying to compel him to conform with their will. And likely he made the best possible decision he could make with the information that he had and with the cards that he had been dealt. So if you're at Good Friday service this year, and as you're reading through the trial and the crucifixion of Jesus, 
Maybe try seeing things from Pontius Pilate's perspective. Maybe you'll get something out of it. He may have been the man to condemn Jesus to die, but to his credit, he didn't know who Jesus was. And you do know who Jesus is. And with every sin that you commit, you are also condemning Jesus to die. So really, who's more culpable in that situation? Just something to meditate on, maybe. But that's all I really have to say about this. Let me know what you guys think down in the comments. And if you like this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up and to subscribe to my channel. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you have a wonderful Holy Week and a very happy Easter. God bless.